Okay, on behalf of the McConnell Center and the Ordered Liberty Program at the University of Louisville, I'd like to offer everyone a warm welcome this evening. The room is full and many others have joined us online. Welcome one and all. My name is Luke Milligan. I'm the director of the university's Ordered Liberty Program. Founded at the university in 2018, the Ordered Liberty Program seeks the advanced study of our inherited legal tradition with an emphasis on five concepts, federalism, separation of powers, constitutional interpretation, natural law, and the common good. To these ends, the Ordered Liberty Program manages a fellowship program for law students, a speaker series, a core curriculum, and international academic conferences, as well as the Ordered Liberty School in Central Europe, based in Budapest. This spring, the Ordered Liberty Program is honored to co-host several keynote seminars with the McConnell Center. The first of our keynote speakers is Professor Jeffrey Pojanowski of the Notre Dame Law School. Professor Pojanowski is one of the nation's leading legal scholars, teaching and writing in the areas of administrative law, jurisprudence, legal interpretation, and torts. He has published widely in the Georgetown Law Journal, Harvard Law Review, Michigan Law Review, Northwestern University Law Review, Virginia Law Review, Yale Law Journal, on and on. Professor Pojanowski received his Bachelor of Arts from Princeton University and his law degree from Harvard, where he was Articles Co-Chair of the Harvard Law Review. He went on to serve as law clerk to the Honorable John Roberts, then on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the D.C. Circuit, and then the Honorable Anthony Kennedy of the U.S. Supreme Court. Professor Pojanowski practiced law with the Washington, D.C. Uh, office of Latham and Watkins, focused, uh, focusing his practice on appellate litigation and administrative law. He joined the Notre Dame Law Faculty in 2010 and in a mere 13 years has really positioned himself as one of the most important scholars in the country. His talk for this evening is titled Constitutional Interpretation and the Classical Legal Tradition. On behalf of the McConnell Center and the Ordered Liberty Program, I want to say thank you, Professor, for joining us this evening. So please, everyone, offer the Professor a warm welcome. Thank you so much. I'm a nerd. I made a handout. Feel free to pass them around. <laughs> that's, that's best. Well, thank you so much for having me, and, and thank you for such a generous uh, in, in introduction. I, I'm, I'm really flattered. Um, and thank you all for having me here tonight. It's uh, excellent to be back in Louisville, I think one of my, my favorite cities. Um, and I'm grateful for the invitation here, and I'm honored that you've decided to take some time out of your evening to hear me talk about, of all things, constitutional interpretation and the classical legal tradition. Now, the classical legal tradition is a pretty broad, capacious term, uh, but here I mean it to refer to central ideas and the Western legal tradition with roots running all the way back to the Greeks and Roman law, uh, ideas that are transformed through Christianity and get their defining shape in the thought of St. Thomas Aquinas. With Aquinas then, we naturally turn to the notion of natural law. This raises questions then of what role natural law plays in understanding and applying our Constitution. Now, given that we're at the McConnell Center, it's useful to note that a jurist who claims allegiance to natural law might have trouble at Senate confirmation hearings. Uh, in fact, then Senator Joe Bi Joseph Biden expressed serious reservations about now Justice Clarence Thomas due to Thomas's previous writings proclaiming allegiance to natural law. Worry about natural law and constitutionalism is also a bipartisan affair. Robert Bork was famously skeptical of appeals to natural law in his writings. Uh, originalists today can sometimes be similarly skittish, especially in response to new theories of common good constitutionalism, which appeal to the natural law and the classical legal tradition. Indeed, the standard picture that we often get in American law links natural law with creative judicial power or constitutional evol evolution away from the rules laid down at the founding. That picture aligns skeptics of natural law with formalist theories of interpretation like originalism. Indeed, it sometimes seems like that, skept that such skepticism is a ground for originalism. Since we can't reason about the natural law and the common good, we should just focus on the positive law of the Constitution and leave it at that. I'm here to say that the picture is a little bit more complicated. 
the classical legal tradition, in fact, cares a lot about formal positive law, law made by, by humans. Nor does the classical le legal tradition require that an interpreter ignore our particular legal inheritance in favor of alien abstract categories with lots of Latin uh, in them. And while it would be anachronistic and smooth over some complications to draw a straight line from the Summa Theologica uh, to what we now call originalism, uh, a very plausible interpretation of the classical tradition points towards something very much like it, at least in a polity with a reasonably just constitution, which I think ours is. Now, to explain how, we need to nail down some basic concepts, which may sound foreign, but are in fact quite intuitive. Uh, and for that reason, I've passed around this nerdy handout. Um, uh, now, first are some basic ideas about how human law relates to natural law. Classical natural lawyers will say that human law flows from natural law in two ways. The first is by what they call derivation. You derive human law from the natural law. There, human law is basically more or less read off from the natural law or re reproduces its norms in human form. Think of laws against murder, rape, theft, and the like. Um, the second way of relating natural law to human law, um, and the more common one, is what natural lawyers call determination. The natural law is uh, often quite general, and lawmakers need to make choices about how to implement it. The banal example here is deciding which side of the road we should drive on, or precisely what marginal rate of income tax we should choose. The natural law in, under, in this understanding doesn't provide a celestial code book giving us all the de detailed features of what human law should look like. Rather, it just directs and constrains our choices. Now, each law is in fact a mix of determination and derivation. Uh, even laws against murder require choices about degrees of culpability, elements, length of sentence, burdens of proof, stuff like that. And even a choice about what side of the road we drive on and marginal tax rates, these choices are ultimately animated by deeper basic commitments to protecting health and safety or ensuring just distribution of resources. And importantly for our purposes, although the natural law will direct and provide limits to choices about what kind of constitution a polity should have, there is a wide range of acceptable options for constitutional lawmakers to choose among. You know, the natural law neither requires nor rejects bicameralism, federalism, or presidential versus parliamentary systems. It does tell us, however, that we need to choose reasonably among those options to create a fair and workable sche uh, scheme of, of cooperation. So that's the first bit of, of natural law technicalities. The second uh, bit, bit of conceptual vocabulary we need is Aquinas' statement on the nature of law. According to Aquinas, Law is an ordinance of reason for the common good, made by him who has care of the community, and promulgated. Now before addressing each of these elements of St. Thomas's definition, it helps to under, uh, put them in their appropriate metaphysical context, namely Aristotle's four causes or explanatory principles. Now the discussion of causes here uh, can mislead uh, the modern listener, since I mean, what we mean here is something broader than the cause of you know, A led to B happening. Uh, the Professor Milligan's invitation caused me to be here speaking with you tonight, but we're talking about cause in a broader sense. A cause here is an aspect of something you need to appreciate before understanding it. We can think of these four causes as the four becauses. This, is, this A is something because of this. Um, so as you see in the handout, these four causes are the formal cause, the final cause, efficient cause, and material cause. Uh, to make this strange vocabulary a little more familiar, we'll use the age-old example of a sculpture. So the formal cause of a sculpture is the shape, uh, the pattern or organization of the statue, which first existed in the mind of the sculptor and then took shape in the marble through the process of sculpting its, its form. The final cause is the purpose or purposes for which the statue exists, the reason why the sculptor made it. The efficient cause is the sculptor's use of tools and techniques to actually make the sculpture. Uh, when lawyers think of causation, this is usually the causation we, we think of. You know, my, you know, my carelessness caused the, the, uh, the car accident. Finally, the material cause is the marble that makes up the statue. Now, although the sculpture we're dealing here with, 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 with marble, the material causes for Aristotle and Aquinas don't have to be matter. It could be anything that takes form. So the sounds you're hearing right now are the material cause of this talk, even though you can't you know, touch it or shape it. 
So now we can apply this framework to each of the elements of St. Thomas's fourfold definition of law. Don't worry, we'll get to the Constitution, I promise. Um, um, but um, so the definition begins with law's formal cause, uh, the ordinance of reason. Next is law's final cause, which is the common good. Law's efficient cause is its making by one with care of the community, a person or group with lawmaking authority. And law's material cause is the matter through which law is promulgated, that which receives the form of law. This material cause, as with each of the other three causes, varies depending on the kind of law at issue. For law made by humans, promulgation is typically accomplished through words or canonical texts. It's important to remember, though, that the law is not identical with the words by which they're promulgated. The words, the promulgation is just one of the, one of the four causes. Now, this is all very abstract, so let's apply this framework to see how a classical lawyer would understand an actual piece of human law, the Constitution of the United States. First, let's consider the formal cause of our Constitution. Law, in its central case, is neither reason floating, floating freely, nor is it the sheer product of human will. Rather, it's a willed choice ordained in response to good reasons. The lawmaker's reason draws on the general principles of the natural law to make reasonable determining choices um, for this community. Uh, how this community, with its history, at this time, should promote the common good and human flourishing. To that end, the preamble of our Constitution says, the people of the United States do ordain and establish this Constitution for the United States by seeking to form, form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to themselves and their posterity, the Constitution's framers use their reason to advance what they understood as the common good of the polity. It's crucial to appreciate, however, that they concretize the results of their reasoning in a written positive law. To ordain, after all, is to issue an ordinance. And this, uh, I'll submit, has important implications for how one should understand the law that is our Constitution. A proper approach to our particular Constitution will not look to free-floating reason or background principles, nor will it look to the surface meaning of the text alone. Instead, it will seek to understand the order of reasons that the framers proposed and the ratifiers enacted. To that end, the classical approach to legal interpretation seeks to understand the reason choices that the authoritative legislators made when they enacted our Constitution. Now, as a matter of method, that plausibly points to something like originalism. To find that reason choice, an interpreter, and here I'm drawing on uh, Oxford natural lawyer Richard Eakins, uh, to find that reason choice, an interpreter would look not only to the text, but also to the publicly available evidence about the mischief that the legislator was trying to remedy, as well as the broader context of the pre-existing background law. Although Eakins is an intentionalist rather than an original public meaning interpreter, his approach could resemble at the level of method the often technically elaborate operations of modern public meaning originalism. And one doesn't have to believe in legislative intent to believe that group actors like legislators or ratifiers are capable of making particular reason choices by enacting canonical authoritative texts. Classical interpreters However, they may often act in practice like modern textualists or originalists, search for a reason choice made in the past and embedded in an authoritative form of words. What this appreciation of form precludes, however, are two com other kind of kinds of common moves that we'll see in constitutional interpretation, or at least in scholarship about it. The first is the tendency to treat the, the Constitution as just the words, and give the surface level literal or clause bound meaning without seeking to, discover, to seeking to discover what more complicated legal propositions could be lurking beneath or behind the text. The other error in the opposite direction is to presume that the Constitution's text simply points to abstract aspirational moral principles. Both of these approaches, surface textualism and moral readings, are insufficiently attentive to identifying which arrangement the constituting authorities chose as an ordinance of reason when they enacted the text as law. So why seek out and follow these reason choices? This is not because one should obey law for its own sake or because one's a moral skeptic and we can't reason about how to live together. Rather, it's a recognition that right practical reason requires 
reasoned answers to open-ended questions and that in a large complex society extending over time we need fixed durable law because unanimity or constant revision of these choices is unreasonable if not impossible revisiting morally uh, reasonable legal choices under the guise of interpretation creates the, the coordination problems that we wanted legal authority to solve in the first place thus it's morally reasonable for officials to understand interpretation as a search for the reason choices that legislators or framers fixed when promulgating positive law to advance the common good. Now, what about the common good? Next of our four causes here. Does the fact that law's ultimate purpose uh, is the common good mean that constitutional interpretation is about deciding what's best for everyone on your own? No. Now, constitutional legislators or you know, framers and ratifiers um, should, be, should be thinking about those kinds of things as they're making choices about what kind of constitution we ought to have. But if you, as an interpreter or a legal official of any type, are faced with a constitution that, um, that ra and if you, as an interpreter, are faced with a constitution that radically undermines the common good, you're, you're not obliged to cooperate in that evil. I mean, you could be an originalist about the constitution of North Korea, but why would you want to play that game, right? But some quick caveats. First, um, let's, go, let's, let's deal with a morally wicked constitution. Um, if the positive law that the interpreter has to apply is in fact morally wicked, Aquinas teaches that one has a moral obligation not to apply it. That does not mean, however, that one's allowed to use your office to say the law is something that it's not, and then impose that with the force of law, unless, of course, the other kinds of law gives you the power to revise. Um, ruling outside of one's jurisdiction itself violates the common good and the natural law. Aquinas would say in those instances you should recuse yourself or resign. Second, it's worth recalling that the generalities of the natural law leave a wide range of reasonable choice in implementing. It's possible and likely common that officials will be faced with positive law that they think is unwise. It's important, however, to draw an important distinction between reasonable disagreement and morally wicked laws. With respect to, the, with respect to, uh, you know, with respect to reasonable disagreement, there's a strong natural law argument that the official must enforce those rules, even if it's not they would have chosen, ones they would have chosen, lest we lose the moral benefits of positive law, such as settlement, coordination, cooperation, and, uh, and, and, and things like that. In a well-functioning polity, the, this first category of reasonable disagreement will be far, far more common. Now, let's get back to what we can say about the common good. One could say a lot, much of which concerns questions of moral philosophy and theology that I'm not at all in the least required to talk about. Um, but for our purposes of understanding constitutions, it's important to bear in mind that the common good is not something that remains at some high level of abstraction. One can't understand the common good of any true human community, such as a family, without understanding how they came to be one. As with families, so too with political communities. Any discussion of the political common good in connection with our Constitution will have to be sensitive to the history of the United States and how it came to be a distinct political community. Our story here is quite unique. To tell it, one has to explain how the formation of one political community in the United States came about through a transformation of 13 colonies into an independent nation. This helps understand how the governmental powers conferred in the Constitution to the consent of one people who dissolved their political bands holding them together with the people of the state of Great Britain and the Declaration of Independence. That same one people subsequently prevailed in the War for American Independence and experienced the defects of confederated governments under the Articles of Confederation. This political history explains why the framers designed the Constitution of the United States to remedy the defects of government under the Articles. The source of those defects was the mismatch between the political community of the United States as, as one people and the government of each state with a separate government legally united in confederation only with the others. To properly serve the political common good of one people, it was, it was fitting to empower one government of, by, and for that people to make and administer the supreme law of the land. The Constitution of the United States accordingly provided for a common national government in addition to the separate state governments, with the unity of, of the people of the United States accounting for the commonness of the political common good served by the Constitution. That's a very complicated picture. And so the framers and the early interpreters of the Constitution appreciated this complex polity created a number of challenging questions. The political and legal relationships between the peoples of the several states and their particular governments on the one hand, 
And the people of the United States and the general government, on the other hand, remain to be worked out over time. Each state government was responsible for the common good of the people of each state in the Union as a political community. The federal government was responsible uh, for the common good of the people of the United States as one political community extending over all the states. Disputes over the various ways in which the Constitution as fundamental law would advance the common good of the people of the United States as a single people, with the distinct state and federal governments, have therefore been with, with us from the beginning. And crucially, there was a beginning. So without an historically grounded account of the unity of the people of the United States with one political common good, you cannot offer an account of how the United States government could arise directly from the people of the United States rather than through the several states. And without this understanding of our complex history and the complex character of our, of our republic, um, it's too easy to assume that the common good towards which the federal constitution is oriented pertains to anything that is good for anyone in the United States. This would be a surprise to the framers, who understood that the states, through their police powers, also had substantial responsibility for advancing the common good of their citizens. The common good in a federal, federated republic like the United States is complex. Identifying who has, who has jurisdiction and who has authority to advance the common good in a particular domain is not always easy, but it's a question we always have to ask. So now we move on to law's efficient cause. Authority with care for the community who makes law. Any understanding of the Constitution must offer an account of the higher law-making authority that makes the Constitution our fundamental positive law. Uh, as my friend Professor Joel Alisea has argued, the sovereign authority behind our particular Constitution are the people who ratified it as a necessary, authoritative means for achie achieving the common good. Rather than agonizing over the dead hand problem in constitutionalism, the classical legal tradition emphasizes the importance of immediate obedience towards legitimate lawmaking authority. Therefore, the orienting goal um, in, uh, is in, in interpreting legal instruments like the Constitution is identifying the propositions the lawmaking authority introduced into the system when it exercised its authority. One has to, again, one has to go back to the origins. If we abandon the original meaning of constitutional provisions in favor of moral readings, by contrast, we're not regarding the Constitution as a deliberate lawmaking act, but rather treating it as a canvas onto which we project the meanings we wish the authoritative lawmakers had intended. Now, that doesn't mean it will always be easy to un for a constitutional interpreter to identify what law the superior lawmaking authority made. And it may be possible that the original law could direct the interpreter to engage in moral readings. That's, that's a possibility. But the charge that a would-be interpreter is reading in rather than reading off or reading out of the Constitution, is a criticism with real bite for the classical natural lawyer who understands the importance of obeying legitimate authority. And finally, we come to promulgation, our fourth cause. Promulgation, uh, the act that announces a legal norm in a particular form, is crucial for law's task. Uh, citizens and officials can't identify authority, authorities' determinations. If they can't do that, law can't do its moral work. For that reason, practically wise legislators will fix their chosen norms in durable forms, not go with the vibe of the thing. This does not mean that all law has to be codified, though the classical legal tradition, in fact, prefers fixing law in canonical systematic texts. I don't think Aquinas would have been a huge fan of the common law, actually. Nor should we say that law is just the words that the lawmakers promulgated. Again, these were, uh, those words are the law's material cause. Signs by which the law is an ordinance of reason for the common good is authoritatively promulgated. Nevertheless, the promulgated law fixes for posterity and points its readers toward those reasoned authoritative choices for the common good. Our constitutional order in particular emphasizes promulgated constitutional law. Um, they have constitutional law in the United Kingdom. They don't have a written constitution. Ours is different. The instrument that the framers chose for securing the people's rights and conferring the government's powers was a written constitution that was to be legally authoritative for future generations by remaining fixed in writing until annulled or changed in the manner that the document itself prescribed. Indeed, a central point of contention in the ratification debates was whether the written promulgated constitution would constrain enough. Brutus feared, and Hamilton sought to rebut, the possibility that equitable interpretation by courts and Congress 
it would expand the government's powers beyond the limits of the promulgated constitution. And after ratification, the same beat went on. Chief Justice Marshall and Marbury linked the Constitution's written promulgation to its capacity to bind in the future and understood our Constitution as a superior, paramount law, unchangeable by ordinary means. The same holds for early commentators of various stripes, such as St. George Tucker, uh, Thomas Sargent, William Rawl, Chancellor James Kent, and most prominently, uh, jo uh, Justice Joseph Story. His 1833 treatise, which consolidated the legacy of the, of the Marshall Court, rejected arguments based in policy and convenience against a fixed constitution. The fluctuations of a living document were unsuitable to the kind of law that the constitution is, which is, he said, to have a fixed, uniform, permanent construction and not be dependent upon the passions or parties of particular times, but the same yesterday, today, and forever. For this reason, any theory of constitutionalism in the classical tradition must attend to the particularities of constitutional promulgation in a given order. Failure to do so not only neglects a crucial cause of legal ordering, but also renders it incapable of offering a complete account of an order like ours, which emphasizes promulgation of a written constitution as a legal instrument establishing authoritative reason choices for the common good. So in sum, the classical tradition's understanding of positive law's nature and value suggests the best way to understand the Constitution is to identify the propositions of law that, can be, that became valid by virtue of the addition of the Constitution to the rest of the law then effect at the time of the founding. An interpreter seeks to understand the original law the Constitution created not because of the Constitution's own say-so, not because lawyering should be a morally neutral enterprise. Rather, one does so because the classical natural law tradition's teaching on the crucial role that the positive law of a promulgated constitution plays in securing the common good of the people of the United States. Or so my co-author and friend, Professor Kevin Walsh and I have argued at perhaps excessive length. Uh, so this offers a different justification uh, for being an originalist than some other theories that we see on offer in the academy and elsewhere. Professor Walsh and I are originalists after all because we're classical natural lawyers and if the theory led us another to another place, that's where we'd go. So this argument does not advance originalism because originalism is just what interpretation is. You know, to, the nature of interpretation is to be originalism, so therefore you should be an originalist. We argue that the point of legal interpretation should be identifying the law laid down, for sure. We're with that. But there are lots of things judges do besides interpretation understood in that sense, and you need a moral argument about why the interpretive stance should have priority for officials who apply the law. Cass Sunstein will say there's no such thing interpretation just is. There are many things that we label interpretation that aren't the search for origins. And there are things that judges do besides search for origins. But we feel the classical natural law argument gives you good reasons for why you should take that, uh, good moral reasons for why you should take that particular stance. This argument also doesn't advance originalism because our constitution gives us everything we want as a matter of politics or justice. No constitution is perfect. And some constitutions or provisions may be so imperfect that they don't merit our adherence. But for the wide array of imperfect constitutions that strike reasonable arrangements for the common good, fidelity to original law is the proper stance for the legal interpreter. In other words, this argument supports originalist interpretation even if the original law of the founding uh, were quite different than it was in fact. Indeed, given the hard questions that remain about the content of the original law of the Constitution or subsequent amendments, which people are still trying to figure out, um, this argument is pre-committed to a very strong presumption of finding whatever we do find as we, as we search for the original understanding of the Constitution's provisions. So this is not a, I'm an originalist because I happen to like what they, what, they, what they gave us at the founding kind of argument. Um, and finally, this argument doesn't defend originalism on the ground that we follow the Constitution just because it's the law and that we are originalists because the law of interpretation around here, unlike in, say, Canada, t tells us to be originalist. Um, you need good moral reasons for choosing an interpretive approach. One should adhere to the positive law because the classical legal tradition tells us that is the right response to an ordinance of reason for the common good promulgated by one in authority. And this is true in any polity, in any place. Now, uh, forming, this approach, or, you know, forming this approach to interpretation is just the beginning. It doesn't guarantee that there are easy questions to every le uh, e easy answers to every legal question out there. This theory of law, nevertheless, plays a crucial anchoring role in determining 
what makes easy cases easy, hard cases hard, and which arguments are more probable when cases are close. And this theory about how to understand the law of the Constitution also doesn't give you a straightforward answer about what to do with the law once you find it. The presumption, of course, is to apply it, right? That's the point. Um, but adjudicating cases involves more than just identifying uh, what a particular piece of law means. Any lawyer will know that limits on jurisdiction, party presentation rules, waiver, issue and claim preclusion, and precedent can prevent an interpreter from applying the correct subset of constitutional law on point. What to do when those limiting rules bar a court from applying the actual original law can be a very challenging question, especially with respect to erroneous precedent. Answering that question, however, is different than simply finding the original law of the Constitution. In fact, there may even be law about what to do when, there's co when those conflicts allow e legal error to persist within the system. Building out a full theory of adjudication is different than having an argument about what counts as good interpretation, it's an, and it's an important task that remains for classical lawyers who anchor their interpretation in the original law. In short, the natural law won't tell you everything you need to know about constitutional adjudication, but it tells you where to look, and the original law of the Constitution will have a pride of place in that vista. The original law of the Constitution won't also, as a matter of justice and morality, give you everything you want or prevent everything you fear, but far more often than not, we will have obligations grounded in natural law to adhere to those authoritative ordinances of reason for the common good. Answers to hard questions about positive law, justice and prudence, call for careful jurists in the mold of Marshall and Story to undertake the difficult lawyer's work of maintaining the law of the Constitution. And that work can and should be soundly embedded in the classical legal tradition. Thanks for having me today.